Right. So hi, I'm Kerry. I'm a PhD student at Durham University, and today I'm going to be talking about these banded textures which we found at the margins of basaltic dikes, which we think are indicative of pulsatory propagation. So these two photos on the left and on the right are from Tenerife, where I've done some fieldwork, and this sample in the middle is from the Columbia River basalts. So the marginal bands can be found at the dike margin, about 10 to 15 centimetres away from it, and they run parallel to it. And whether the exposure is good enough, you can usually follow a single band for a few metres. They're kind of picked out by a variation in colour, or sometimes they'll have weathered to form these ridges. And more often than not, you'll also see this systematic variation in vesicularity moving inwards. They're a few millimetres to a few centimetres wide, and they increase in width towards the dike centre and become less distinct. They were quite common in the field area, probably in about half the dikes that we studied, but they're also found in basaltic dikes around the world. There are lots of reports in the literature of very similar features, which seems to imply that there's some underlying physical process driving their formation. The reason that we care about these marginal bands is because marginal material is some of the first to solidify within the dike. So it's the first magma to enter the fracture at the tip of the dike. Moving inwards, we can read our textures as a time series so they get younger towards the dike centre. And this time series holds valuable information about propagation processes, all the way from that initial crack propagation through to steady magma flow within the established dike. So this is our first sample. It's from the Tello Massif in Tenerife, which is in the northwest of the island. And as I said before, lots of dikes in this region have these marginal bands, usually seen as this variation in colour. This particular dike had particularly prominent bands, that's why we took the sample from it. And when we took thin sections, we found that the bands are actually defined by a variation in the concentration of plagioclase phenocrysts. So the band starts, which are kind of darker, are defined by a sudden drop in the concentration of phenocrysts which we can show either as a drop in the area fraction, which I've highlighted with these red arrows, but we can also view this as a drop in the number density as well. There's also a kind of systematic um, repeating pattern in the vesicularity within each band, each one holding a peak in vesicularity, although this does become less obvious as we move towards the dike centre. So if we focus on the phenocrysts first, the bands themselves are defined by the variation in the concentration of phenocrysts, with band starts defined by this drop in the phenocryst number density. And this seems to imply that within the active dike, the distribution of phenocrysts was non-uniform. The best explanation that we can come up with to explain this is um, flow differentiation. And if you haven't heard of this before, it's this process which occurs when you have particles suspended within a flow and it's caused by the collisions between these particles, which causes particles to migrate from the steep velocity gradients at the margins to be concentrated towards the shallower velocity gradients in the flow centre. So within our dike, we'd have these phenocrysts suspended within the magma and they would be kind of forced away from the walls. Clearly, to create these bands where this pattern is repeated, we would need repeated pulses of magma through the dike system. So this has happened several times, moving phenocrysts towards the centre of a magma pulse, and this has then been solidified into place as the bands. So if we move on to look at our vesicles, we see that within each band, the vesicularity increases and then drops at the start of the next band, although this does become less obvious moving into the wider bands towards the dike centre. But we can read these variations in vesicularity moving inwards as a time series. So here we have progressive inward solidification and we're getting our bubbles captured as vesicles. If pressures drop, then the bubbles grow and this leads to us capturing a higher vesicularity in our rock. If pressures then rise, then the bubbles will shrink and this causes us to capture a lower vesicularity. So when we see these cyclical peaks in vesicularity, this is suggestive of pressure fluctuations as it's solidified. And we can therefore infer that each of these bands is associated with a pressure drop leading to these peaks in vesicularity.
seen particularly well in our sample from the Columbia River basalts, where we have lots of these well-defined peaks in particularity. In this sample, we didn't see as strong a trend with phenocrysts, mostly because there were far fewer of them and because they were much larger. But the bands still show the same trend, they're millimetres to centimetres in width, and they get wider and less distinct moving towards the dike centre. So now we can tie this all together into this kind of conceptual idea of how these bands are formed. We know that our marginal material comes from the dike tip, so it holds information about propagation processes. Our phenocryst gradients suggest that we've had successive magma pulses through the dike system, and our particularity variations suggest that this was associated with fluctuations in pressure. So these textures taken together are suggestive of pulsatory flow in the tip of the dike. The cause of this pulsatory flow is likely to be cooling and solidification. So the tip of the dike is very narrow, which makes it vulnerable to cooling. So as it cools and becomes more viscous and potentially solidifies, this can temporarily stall propagation, at least until pressures in the region behind it rises high enough to rupture through that stalled region. So we end up with this cycle of propagation, cooling, stalling and then rupturing, and this creates our pulsatory magma flow. When these pulses repeat over and over again, this is how we generate our bands at the margins of the dike. And importantly, this means that we can view each band as the half width of a magma pulse. And this allows us to come up with a time scale for their formation. We can see that the majority of our bands are actually less than 20 millimetres wide. And this is the half width of the pulse. So these pulses are very narrow. This isn't really beyond the realms of possibility. Because actually when we were out in the field, we did see dike tips, which were very, very narrow such as this one here, which is less than three centimetres across. We could actually even visualise this dike tip as being the first band. Had there been subsequent magma pulses through this dike, it would have inflated wider and wider step by step, building up bands over time. We actually have two timescales to think about here. We have the time taken for each pulse to solidify, but then we also have the time interval between each pulse arriving. And we work this out by using a very simple one dimensional conduction model. So here we've just injected a magma pulse at 1200 degrees and we <clears throat> assign it the widths of the Tenno bands. We allow it to cool to a final temperature TF before we then inject the next band. <clears throat> we, um, we run this model with and without latent heat. So this provides the upper and lower bounds for likely solidification timescales. What I'm showing on the y-axis is the width of accreted solid material that's at the margin. This could alternatively be viewed as a solidification front, so the boundary between the solid region at the margin and the liquid region in the core of the dike. So as it cools inwards, we see these steep regions here as it solidifies, and this takes time TS, so that's the solidification time scale. It then has this kind of plateaued region here, which is the time it takes to then cool down to the final temperature TF. So if we say that we want there to be little cooling, so it remains hot, TF is a thousand degrees, it's only just solidified when the next pulse arrives. What we have found with our model is that this actually melts back the previous pulse. So it's so hot that it starts to erode the band that was previously left. And we don't see any textual evidence for this. So these timescales are unlikely, they're too short. However, at the other end, we don't see any evidence of chilled margins between our pulses. So they probably haven't cooled below anything like 500 degrees. So this actually provides us our likely timescales for each magma pulse, and it's probably something like several minutes to tens of minutes. The implications of all this are that we can actually use dike margins to better understand dike propagation, which could inform models of how magma moves through the crust. It could be really useful. It also implies that solidification might play a bigger role in controlling dike propagation than is often thought. So because the tip of the dike is so narrow and so vulnerable to cooling, this could have effects on the larger body that's following behind it if it holds it up. It also means that we might want to rethink about how magma interacts with the host rock. So if it's solid at its tip, how is it transmitting pressures to instigate fracturing? It might also help in interpreting seismicity as magma is moving through the crusts, because often this is seen to happen in bursts. Maybe this is happening because things are freezing up, then rupturing and starting again, probably on a larger scale than what we're seeing here in the bands. And I guess 
kind of building on that, my final question is, what is the largest scale at which this could occur? So yes, these bans are happening on small scale, relatively short time scales, but what is the largest scale at which a dike could freeze up and potentially build up pressure, rupture and start again, forming larger layers? So that's about it. Thanks for listening.